All right, now we're going to move on to the fun part and do a panel discussion here. Um, the the format of this is that we have some prepared questions and we'll uh, introduce the panelists and ask them uh, to answer the questions. Um, I encourage people to, if they have additional follow up questions or comments, they can put them in the chat and we'll try and uh, Maggot will try and keep track of that. And if we have some interesting uh, additional ideas that we want to introduce into the discussion, we might um, uh, uh, call on some of those, but uh, we, we don't want to cut anybody off. Um, just use the, the, the chat to do that. Um, so let me introduce the uh, panel members who volunteered to help us out here. Um, I apologize right up front. Uh, I hope I say your name right, and I'm going to use uh, an abbreviated uh, version of your bio because I don't want to have to read these bios all the way through, uh, just in the interest of time since we're already running late. Uh, first, I want to introduce Steve Jenkins, who is a research fellow in the Acquisition Innovation Research Center at Stevens Institute of Technology, and he's the former chief engineer of the MC project at JPL. He's a former member of our team. Uh, he holds a PhD in electrical engineering from UCLA. Steve, are you there? Can you hear us? I am here and I can hear you. I'm getting my camera turned on right now. OK, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, next panelist is Elisa Kendall. Um, Elisa is a partner in Thematics Partners LLC and a graduate level lecturer in computer science focused on data management, data governance, knowledge representation, and decision system, decisioning systems. She holds a BS in mathematics from UCLA and AM in linguistics from Stanford. She's right over here. Nice speaker, thank you. Okay, and you've got your microphone on, so can people hear her? I think that is a, I hope so. Our next panelist is uh, Florian Norit. Am I saying that na name right? Yeah, you could. Florian is, researches model-based engineering approaches at CEA List, including contributing to Papyrus and open source MBSE tool-based uh, on UML and SysML. He holds a PhD from Paris Saclay University, and we heard him speak earlier. So thank you, Florian. Uh, next panelist is Michael Halverson, sitting right over here. Uh, Michael leads strategic direction at the Unified Ontologies Foundry, developing the ontological basis underpinning the engineering management platform for integration, realization, and execution empire, which he talked about here earlier. He holds a BS in aerospace engineering, a BS in mechanical engineering from Auburn University, and he's now a doctoral student in aerospace systems engineering at the University of Alabama, Huntsville. Did I get that right? Yes, thank you. And we'll turn your microphone on when we uh, uh, start talking. Uh, the next panelist is Kane Ishibayashi. Did I say that right? OK, uh, Kane is a founder and CEO of Innovative Design LLC, a systems engineering consulting firm in Tokyo and project assistant professor, professor in systems engineering MBSC at the Graduate School of Systems Design and Management at Keio University in Tokyo. He holds a BE in mechanical engineering from the University of Minnesota and an MS uh, from the Graduate School of System Design and Management from Keio. University. Did I say that? University, right? Great. And our last panelist is Asan Kamar. Um, Asan leads the Ford Motor Company's platform architecture and system design team, developing and testing system and software architecture for an embedded and connected platform that will power future Ford vehicles. He has a multiple multidisciplinary background in control design, mechatronics, embedded systems, and MBSE. And we gave a talk earlier in the day. Asana, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you. OK. So um, uh, protocol, I'm going to introduce a question, and then I will call on each of the panelists as we go uh, around the room. 
uh, try and get uh, uh, an answer and um, um, might have some follow up uh, questions for some of these, depending on uh, the question. And we're just going to go as long as the time lasts for this. Uh, I have several uh, questions. Um, uh, we'll just see how far we can go. So the, the first question. If you want to show the screen so that we see the remote uh, analyst. Let me uh, introduce the question okay. and then. Um, okay. and then exit that. Yeah, it can exit that so we can see the panelists. Uh, OK, so very broad general question. What can we collaborate on? Um, we started out by just let's try and focus it a little bit um, with the introdu introduction of system system LB2. Uh, it seems like there is a, an opportunity to integrate semantic technologies with SysML v2. Do you care about this? Do you see value in this? Does it seem like a good opportunity for us to collaborate? So uh, I'm going to start with Elisa. OK, a quick disclaimer, and Ed would probably shoot me if I didn't uh, provide this to you. Yeah, well, so I'm on the architecture board and board of directors for the object management group. So if I don't jump up and down and cheer for SysML version two, I would be uh, remiss in presenting myself to you all. So a tremendous amount of work has gone into that specification. There is a subset of it, as many of you know, called Kermel, which is designed to provide some of the semantic underpinnings of SysML version two. I think the biggest challenge with respect to mapping ontologies to SysML and to Kermel is likely the lack of separation between the declarative aspects of Kermel and the behavioral aspects. I think that's something we need to look at as we work through finalization of the standard. And, and maybe it could still be in one specification, but there needs to be some clear distinction there that um, makes a mapping feasible. The other challenge I think we have is uh, it, there are a few ad hoc approaches to mapping ontologies to other things. At OMG, we have a standard called MOF to RDF. The kernel isn't really MOF, although parts of kernel are kind of MOF. So I think there's some work that needs to be done there. And this one standard that almost nobody knows about could form a partial basis for that. But there are also other things out in the semantic web community that could help with that mapping. And I think one of the first things this community could do as a contribution to all of that would be to work towards a really nice mapping approach for mapping ontologies to SysML version two, whether they reflect the OML subset of OWL or OWL DL, a broader capability for those people that need to use that. I, th I think that would be a tremendous contribution to the community, something that is very consistent, well-defined mapping language um, that respects the semantics of both SysML version two and of uh, OML OWL. Um, one step in that direction, I'll put my um, OMG hat back on, um, is that there is a library that you may or may not be aware of that's been published last year by the OMG called the Commons Ontology Library. In that library, there are some common patterns um, that are really useful for virtually every ontology people need to build. Um, but one of them uh, is a brand new quantities and units ontology, strictly scalar quantities at the moment. We are adding tensor and vector quantities over the coming year. The authors of that, if it gives you any uh, a little bit more confidence in what we're doing, uh, include Hans-Peter de Koenig and Roger Burkhart and Evan Wallace from NIST and other folks that were actively involved in the development of the libraries for quantities and units that are a component of SysML version 2. And the idea is if we get the ontology right, which we are hoping to do, the first exercise is to generate the reference data 
for the entire library of 700 quantities and units in the SysML version 2 standard um, in OWL as a reference library that everyone could use as part of the work that they do. That's pretty fundamental, but it would also help us validate A, the mapping, and B, the work that's been done in SysML version 2, and C, we could do all of the logical consistency checking, completeness checking, and everything else you would want to do using that mapping and that library. So, um, you know, all right. I'll take my hat off and let you go to somebody else. I, I just want to say that the ontology that it is, uh, is referred to is, is posted as one of the virtual posters. So please check it out. There. Yeah, and there are also links on the OMG site, and I'm happy to point people in the right direction. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let's go online. Steve Jenkins, what do you think? Well, I was I was hoping you'd come to me next. Um, so hi, Elisa. Nice to nice to hear from you. Good again. to see you too. Um, Hans Peter and I meet weekly, um, and we've been discussing exactly this for a long time. And and literally, while I'm listening to the talks this afternoon, I've been sketching out in prototype form a transformation from SysML v2 to OML. Uh, now, obviously, there's a great deal of expressivity in SysML v2 that's well beyond description logic. So like you like you say, one of the things we're really going to have to do is partition what what it makes sense to map from what it doesn't. But Hans Peter and I are both very interested in focusing on the quantities and units, although he now wants to call it quantities and measurement references. Um, but but literally we 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 are, you know, working on trying to translate the the essential content of that to OML, which makes a very nice, convenient bridge to expressing it in OWL. So um, I'm doing this partly as a learning experiment, learning experience for me for SysML v2. I've sort of followed it over the years, but it's a big, really complicated thing. So I'm trying to learn it by trying to do do something with it with actual code. And I've I've joined the system modeling community as as an individual, because I'm kind of a free agent now. I'm mostly retired, so I'm I'm looking forward to working on this more. Well, we'd be happy to have you in our little ragtag working group if you would like and to I, join I us. I will. I will be at the meeting in Reston. I, I, Elisa, I don't know if you know that I've moved to New York, but uh, I did. But I am. Uh, I'll be at the meeting in Reston. Cool. We need to have dinner. Thanks, Steve. Okay, let's do it. Let's come back in the room and uh, Kane, what do you think? Hi, so um, I would like to talk a little bit about the, my, my background and my where I do my business in Japan. It's a little different here from here. So systems engineering new, surprisingly, for the Japanese engineering community. But you may say that we have we build very good cars, right? So there must be very good systems engineering going on. Yes, there is going on, but it's very implicit. It's never explicit. So what's really interesting is that it's only aerospace and some part in defense and aerospace um, doing explicit systems engineering and especially mainly automotive. They're very much explicit, explicit meaning it's a, it's almost like a, a, this guy's doing a very good job. This lady's doing a very good job. It's, it's never uh, became explicit practice, but it's, it's, it's becoming more explicit because our cars are getting more complex. Of course, the the gentleman from Ford explained to us was the uh, connected cars, right? So the cars is it's not just 2.5 ton moving steel; it's, it's connected to everything else, and something is talking to the cars. Cars are talking to themselves. So it's 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 a huge system now, and so um, the, in in Japan, systems engineering is is a, is a boom now. It's everybody's uh, trying to learn about it, and of course MBSC as well. So what's happening is that people are reading about SysML, reading about SysML v2 and all that, but they're just looking at diagrams, unfortunately, which can happen, you know, you can probably easily imagine because it's pretty, it's it's nice. And ontology, oh my gosh, it's too scary for the people. And but I, I really am you know, sitting here for, for a few few hours today, and I'm I'm more than more than enough to believe that this is the future because it will help us to to deal with the more complexity and to to collaborate across the industry across the, the country so 
but but I, I so about the collaboration. What I'm asking you, folks, who's a little bit more advanced in the journey, uh, to help us to present the the value of this ontology and how can it help us build better system, safer system, more complex system to higher management. Of course, younger generations, I don't know, I'm in the middle of that, I guess, um, like new technology, you see, the, see the, uh, the possibilities, but the older generations or more experienced ones believe what they've done before and not so much in the new technologies, but, but still we need their, their support. We need their support, not just in the funding wise, but their, their experience, their knowledge, I want them to feed that into our ontology and of course the methodologies and practices. So um, I would love your help um, and maybe we can collaborate. You know, what is the, the what is the, how, how can we communicate the value proposition of having a very strong ontology behind MBSC, behind systems engineering and how can we benefit from that? I will second that. <laughs> uh, let's go to Asan. What do you think? Uh, I don't have much to add. I think um, in, uh, one example I will, because already a lot has spoken. One example I will give is I recently had a bug where someone specified left and right um, actuators in their design. And when it was implemented, the left was flipped to right and right was flipped to left. And basically, tells us how simple problems we could identify um, if we had reasoning behind our design specifications and implementation. And we don't have to find them in an actual hardware in the loop test. So I think that's my addition to what was already said. All right, thank you. Florian, what do you think? Um, so, yeah, CSML v2 is, is um, kind of an obvious direction uh, um, to uh, continue our collaboration and, and uh, research and development. Um, yet, th th there are some technical um, things that have to be sought out, uh, especially uh, what I think of is the uh, actual uh, ontological um, nature of CSML v2 or more explicitly of caramel um, there was an attempt to uh, translate to uh, all at some point uh, from CSML v2 um, and it has been like uh, posed and, and so on so this has to be sought out from a, from a theoretical uh, perspective um, and also the the the, the wool design so First of all, what they did is, is just amazing work. Um, and uh, especially uh, integrating um, the um, ontological behavior modeling as part of the core uh, of the language is uh, something that uh, we, we, we need to um, review and, uh, and, and, and exploit and, 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 and like consider all the, the the implication of this, uh, how we can use it for for um, for the, the the system design that uh, and then, and the system engineering. So so definitely uh, uh, the direction we, we are interested in, uh, but uh, many technical uh, details to uh, to sort out. All right, thank you. Um, so the second question. Oh, do we have an uh, follow-up? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Michael, I saved you for last. I'll channel my inner Simon Sinek and start with why. Uh, would you mind bringing up the text of the question? Um, the only reason I ask this is because this question brings up a lot of great points that have been discussed here, and I won't belabor those, but what the question doesn't do is address the purpose of the modeling. So model-based systems engineering is a tool. It does not do systems engineering for you. If you consider MBSC a catch-all tool to solve all of your problems, it's seeing every problem as a nail and MBSC is the hammer. You're gonna hit it all the same way uh, as the old saying goes. So 
said this earlier, start with the output and work backwards. If you had this integration, this OML to OWL to SysML mapping, what would you do with it? Because if you don't know, you might waste your time mapping it for your specific purpose, and then you're modeling for the sake of modeling without having it validated to the purpose of whatever it is you're trying to do. So just be cognizant of why you want to do it before you go through the effort of doing it. That's oh, all. Ed has a follow up. Yeah, if you don't mind me horning in on the panel. Go ahead. I can tell you that as it was mentioned, it was considered very early on to try to map Carmel level, especially to Al. And we actually did an early mapping um, to Al and the intent, we had a very specific intent, and that was because one of the reasons we had wanted to have a formal basis, the system LV2 and Kermel, was to be able to do reasoning. Well, there's a lot of technology out there for reasoning, and we figured that if we could ride off the on top of the reasoning capability that was also already in OWL, that would give us a leg up until we got more specific reasoners that were based on what we're doing. To be honest, we hit a roadblock fairly early on. Now, I think there are ways around that, but when you take the subset of Carmel that is directly mappable or naively mappable to LDL, turned out to be a lot less rich than we thought. And there were some things that we added at the Carmel level in the core that became critical to how we built the rest of Carmel and System LV2 on. And they didn't map easily to OWL. I think they can be mapped. They could probably map more easily to OML, um, but we just didn't have the bandwidth and the people to do that. So we very specifically wanted to get a leg up on all the reasoning. And um, as it's turned out, people are working in on reasoning with Kermel and <clears throat> System LV2, and they're almost right now pretty much mapping it to something. Um, not so much to Al, but to Alloy and to other um, technologies. Uh, so that is a reason to do it, to get that capability until somebody puts the effort in to create a native Kermel reasoner, which is probably still a few years out. But actually, I can't help with this, but to Michael's point, the question is really, is the mapping to AL and OML, or should the mapping be to something else, to your point, right? Because at the end of the day, if you want to answer, like, say, a 40-level semantic questions about, you know, did the chicken lay the egg or the egg lay the chicken or whatever, you know, that's a particular kind of, like, process evolution question, whereas if the intent is to check, you know, have we make sure that we're not connecting the green wires to the red plug or to your point, like, left to right or right to left, that may be a different kind of problem. Right, so it seems that the questions that we're interested in, interested in, almost like forces us to actually think about what is the kind of semantics that we need to answer that question, and and from there would motivate mapping, you know, CSML v2 or a subset of it to that particular semantic formalism. Right. And, and I was just answering, yes. Why do you want to do it? I was giving the reason we had thought of doing it. You have a good point, and, and that was sort of part of the point I was making too, is that because of the issues we, we ran into, perhaps OWL isn't the best target, but I think it's, and that was also John Carlo's point, um, for, there's so much out there and there's the community that it is worth looking at. And I don't think we're that far off. It just, we thought it would be an easier place to start and it wasn't as easy as we thought, which tells you something about like John Carlos said, some of the limitations, specifically with the DL limitations. Um, but when you do that mapping, you're, you're going to have to also to answer real questions, not just map thermal, but you have to map a bunch of the libraries, which have a bunch of the other information that we use at the V2 level. And that's a lot of stuff. And, but at least that was just talking about getting into that for quantities and units. Well, and Steve, right? And so, Steve. So, so uh, it's very, it's still valuable. It's just, not necessarily easy. I think so, there's a corollary. So that's actually, a really good segue to my second question. Wait, wait, wait. Before you go there, there's a corollary I haven't heard around the room, which is if you had really, really well developed controlled vocabularies for certain areas of interest or ontologies that provided access to back end data for certain things that were relevant to your modeling, wouldn't you want to map it the other way? 
so that you could take content that's available in control vocabularies like through MVF and in other ontologies and bring them in and reuse those same very consistent vocabularies for the development of your system okay. models. I think that direction is quite valuable. Great. OK. So following on to that, um, in software engineering and in application development, we have the concept of a minimum viable product, which you use this when you're taking on a project of huge scope and you're trying to get the resources to do it and you need to convince the sponsors that it's worth doing. So what is the minimum viable product that we can produce in a sufficiently complete form to prove it works, right? Um, in the context of, of what we were just talking about, what do you think, Elisa? So we've just done this for a pharmaceutical project I've worked on for identification of medicinal products. And I would argue there is a way to go about identifying what that MVP should be and how to do the development for it. And the first thing is you need some stakeholders that have a hard problem to solve. Mm -hmm. It's a people issue more than it is an engineering issue. And then secondly, um, the guys that were working on this project among these pharmaceutical companies, the problem was really that there are some ISO standards for identifying medicines, including the underlying pharmaceutical product, which is the thing delivered to the patient, the medicinal product, which includes the packaging, which is unique to every jurisdiction around the world. And there is the uh, underlying substance material that's used to create those pharmaceutical products. There are, I don't know, 57, 85, pick a number, um, different ways of describing the same substance. The only way to ensure that a substance is a substance is a substance is by its molecular structure. There is no common identifier for almost any substance worldwide, and that is the first problem. Mm -hmm. And so we went after this problem because um, people were dying, and one of the pharmaceutical companies that was involved in the project had regulators come to them and say, people are dying, and they're dying because of this toxic that we've detected in their blood. Where is this toxic substance coming from in your manufacturing project? Um, process and can you remove it from that process? And so they dug through every system around the world that produced that drug and said, it's not in the drug. And then they had to backtrack from there into their manufacturing systems, into their engineering pipelines and say, where is this toxin creeping in to what people are giving to patients? Where could it possibly be? And they were desperate and it took them 60 days. If it takes 60 days to identify something that kills people, one or two of us might be on that list, you know? So um, that was the first question that we answered as part of this MVP was to find all of the products, including all of the medicinal products, which means the packaging, where that toxin might have been found. And the 60 days it took them to find it, and it was in the packaging, not in the medicine, and it leached into the medicine through the packaging. That's how those people were getting sick. The 60 days that it took them to find the answer is now done in a matter of seconds. That got their attention. But it's a life and death kind of a thing, although here with engineering systems, driving a car can be a, a life or death kind of a thing. If you're talking about sending uh, a manned system up into the ether, then you're talking about life or death. And even unmanned systems are very, very expensive to build. So go after a question that is hard to answer, that spans multiple systems where you have data interoperability challenges. And one single question that you think in six months you could try to answer. And if you have to bookend it, it can't be something that takes months and months and months to do. It has to be six months. It has to demonstrate some real life problem. You have to have real stakeholders with skin in the game participate. And that's what will get you that minimum viable product. And that's what will get you the money 
to go to the next stage. Definitely agree. Doing it in a short amount of time is essential. Let's go to Asan. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, the uh, defining the problem, which is uh, cross-functional or is a sufficiently complex system that you can use as a reference point to expose um, what it takes us to define the overall system in the SysML description. And is that complexity itself, then what do we not have in there that actually the, uh, the transformation identifies as a result of uh, inferences? Um, so I think there is a, I, my own experience working with the tech is there are specific questions that the ontological analysis will help you identify. And there are things that it can help you identify, but it's uh, um, not the biggest bang for the buck. And maybe some of those things will be identified in the actual test. Um, so the MVP should focus on what is the low hanging fruit. Um, what are the things engineers um, or in specification of a system that we um, make a mistake on um, just because uh, we tend to, for engineers are great at focusing on complex problems, but we kind of uh, not pay a lot of attention to silly, silly um, problems that are right in front of us. Um, I think that's the biggest bang for the buck in terms of MVP. And now then if you translate into different domains because you will see different patterns in different domains. So I agree with like a pharmaceutical pattern or an automotive or aerospace. These are all different MVPs. I think it'll give you the data point. Um, and we, we, we have discussed the same thing with uh, Maged or some of, uh, some of our pilots um, or MVPs were in the similar direction. Um, how can we understand what we cannot find usually with our own infrastructure. Someone online had a question, follow-up question there. Um, can you go ahead and ask that question? All right. Well, maybe as, as part of a minimal uh, viable Product. Uh, I, in addition to what has been said so far, um, it's usually important uh, to. Um, I feel like it, it's important to have um, great value uh, right out of the box. Uh, and and in in um, in this uh, perspective, I, I feel like having um, the standard system analysis especially for fields like uh, there are some standards in terms of safety or security you have those um, uh, like already implemented and available to show the value of how you validate or check or verify those uh, those um, uh, things uh, is, is um, definitely something uh, that could be part of a minimum uh, viable uh, product Okay, thank you. Um, let's come back to Michael. Um, so we were talking about SysML, but you're developing an empire. <laughs> What's the MVP? The MVP for empire specifically? Okay, yes. Le um, let's talk about this in terms of both the question and what we're doing here to build on the point of process efficiency. So taking what something is deadly, 60 days to 30 seconds obviously really important right that question was asking uh and and you said it specifically did you do it right but an mvp is more about is it validated to the purpose of the stakeholder need because if you have a product systems only exist to deliver value to stakeholders and the stakeholders have some operational deficiency that is characterized by a stakeholder concept or a stakeholder need or requirement depending on who you ask and then that's translated into the system requirements great in that question it said to demonstrate a capability ontologies are about reducing semantic ambiguity i'm gonna get really pedantic here when you have a test 
or an analysis. Tests involve some kind of instrumentation. You are sensing something. That sensor, that instrumentation is going to measure a value. You are evaluating a parameter. Promise I'm getting the answer. The analysis is simulating or calculating. Uh, simulation, calculation, and measurement being three types of evaluation, all ways of prescribing a value to a parameter. Demonstration, if you consider a capability to be a function to a given performance value, output thrust uh, greater than or equal to 10 newtons, generate heat less than or equal to five watts, that kind of thing. If you consider that to be a capability and no other things to be capabilities, then it requires you to output a value to verify or validate. If you say you're demonstrating a capability, inspection and demonstration both output Boolean values, zeros or ones, yes or no. A demonstration cannot output a performance value that can verify that a design is compliant to a requirement, a specifically a capability requirement. My point here is that Empire is supposed to make those semantic connections to tell someone that a stakeholder need that is associated with some operational deficiency relates to one or more controlled natural language requirements. And those controlled natural language requirements based on the requirement type that they are, have a specific type or specific set of verification methods that can verify that requirement. So you don't have engineers going out and applying a verification method that is not validated to the type of requirement that it is. It's about not wasting time. So a minimum viable product for Empire is one that can take a well-formed set of stakeholder needs, translate them into a well-formed set of requirements, plus additional system uh, model information that is all internally co uh, consistent, and then generate a set of work products specific to each team in a work breakdown structure, work cost structure, work activity structure, and then help people do what they should be doing in the order that they should be doing it, instead of giving them the option to do something they shouldn't be doing. Okay, oh. but doesn't that sound like kind of a large MVP? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, sco the scope is rough, but to integrate project management and systems engineering, that's, that's the task, that's the job. Um, so big MVP, but when I read demonstrate a capability, it's meaningless. You got to be more specific than that. And even in the ENCOSI handbook, um, you see capability used many different ways. Attribute used many different ways. Property, states, modes are not being specific enough. And that's what ontologies can give us. I heard that. Um, let's go to Steve. OK, well, um, what, part of what makes this problem really hard is that when you do a demonstration, the, the audience for the demonstration just sees what's on the surface. They don't see what's underneath. But what's important to us is really what's underneath. What we're really trying to demonstrate is the power of what's underneath. Um, so I think we don't need one problem. I think we need two problems or three problems that on the surface look radically different, but for which we can make a credible argument um, backed up with real data to say 98% of what solved these two problems is common and reusable. And, and the, the real product here is the adaptable framework that was easily adapted to these two radically different problems, right? Maybe computing the mass properties of a space vehicle and doing Elisa's pharmaceutical problem. Um, and and unfortunately, that's just it's a hard thing to get across. But I think that's the real essence of the common approach is that you have reusable patterns, frameworks, tooling, um, and it it's it's highly capable and well thought out and well documented and and people are familiar with it enough to adapt it very quickly to a new class of problems. So I think what we need is a small set of problems that on the surface look nothing like each other, but for which we can say, look, what's underneath the covers is the same machinery. Uh, yeah, and you pointed out uh, a really good point there that um, 
what's important here is what's under the covers. It's easy to do a mock-up and convince managers, wow, that's really cool. You know, that looks really great, but it doesn't really do anything, right? Uh, right, and you know, we had this problem for a long time when our initial application of Caesar was harness design, and we kept getting asked these questions, why are you guys spending so much money building a harness design tool? Because we're not building a harness design tool. We're building a tool that can do lots and lots of things, including harness design, but that's a subtle point. It's difficult to get across. All right, Kane, what do you think? Yes, um, reflecting on Dr. Jensen, Jenkins and Elisa that um, I, I really agree that we should have several different types of, of, of minimum viable products so that it will resonate with different groups of people. And the pharmaceutical safety um, <clears throat> is very, one very good example, I think. And automotive, of course, is safety is an issue. And they're very good at traditional safety, but they're interested in the new kinds of safety. So your car is called up with your app, right? And autonomous vehicle doesn't know if it runs over a human. Did you know that? Autonomous vehicle does not have a sensor to detect that it hit a human. Or it's even hanging beneath the car. Doesn't know, okay? No car has that sensor yet. But that's a new, very new kind of safety that they're seriously uh, discussing right now. And of course, laws are not there. Regulations, not there yet. So definitely this is a ontological, there's so much ontological issues. Of course, the law making people needs to talk in their, they're, not, they're talking in their language and manufacturers, they're talking in their language. Oh my gosh, police, they're talking in a very different language. They're very mad at you know, what's going on with autonomous vehicle systems. So it's, it's, it's another great example, I think, and it's very different from the pharmaceutical one. But like, like uh, Mr. Jen uh, Dr. Jenkins says, if, if it can be explained and, and, and solved, or at least, you know, try to solve or address by a mechanism, the similar mechanism, ontology, I think that that'll really makes a huge difference. And I think that'll resonate with a lot of different people. All right. Florian, do you have some thoughts on this? Florian, the Florian. question is for you. Um, no, no, I just said it. I'm um, not not much more on on this uh, on this. Uh, it, if if you look at what has been done uh, by um, Maggot and, and the community and and, and the, the team, um, it's it's already in some sense um, um, exploitable and 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 um, and providing a lot of value. Um, as it has been mentioned by uh, Stephen, uh, the, the idea is uh, maybe not to to show. Um, what is uh, under the hood, but more uh, what can be done out of it, um, and and um, and um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Maggot, were there any other follow-up comments or questions in the chat that we should mention? I'm just looking at the time, and we have ten minutes left, and I can ask the next next question. Um, we would have to make the answers very quick. A, a brief comment on these MVPs. As we, as an ontological community, decide on which products we should and should not be developing, uh, we will, of course, have our own MVPs. Through the OMG standards, there are obviously these long processes to get some things approved. As we develop tools, if we're not embarrassed of our MVPs, we have launched too late. So we got to put them out there for community feedback to see what's useful and what's not. So, I will, so go ahead. Uh, there is a, a a question in the chat that uh, I want to bring up just quickly. Um, I know Mantra is asking, are we only interested in uh, tackling the problem of information management? 
as opposed to solving systems engineering problems. He, he said that some of the of SE problems may overlap with the information management problem, but in this community, I think the question is, should we, um, which level of issues should should we tackle to tackle the the information management issues, which kind of I alluded to in some of in in the R and D directions, or should we focus on the what you can build on top of that uh, system engineering problems? I have my well, own. You have to focus on the system engineering problems, but you can't solve those without solving the information management. And and the other challenge that we have in systems engineering is that all systems are different. And so solving a particular problem that's really important to us here at JPL, um, harness engineering, um, doesn't necessarily scale to everybody. It's not really impressive to everybody. Um, and I think we yeah, all have I think, similar problems. I think that it may not be, but it, it may be as well, uh, Dave, right? For example, when 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 I talk to you guys on your harness engineering problems, I'm like, yeah, okay. But right now, even in automotive, we have an issue about wire harnesses being carrying too much weight. It's exactly the same problem. Yeah, I, I know. Well, that even even, even more than that, it, even in harness design, only the thinnest veneer on the very top of it was about electrical harnesses. Everything else is a very reusable pattern about interfaces. And the same pattern works for mechanical attachments. The same pattern works for exactly. information flows. And, and again, that's what's difficult. What people see is the problem on the surface. They don't see the patterns underneath. There's hardly any of that machinery that's unique to harnesses. Correct. Okay, so in that in that reusable framework that Dr. Jenkins is mentioning, that is what we should do with the system elements, how we should model those interfaces. Steve Cash earlier asked a question uh, or, or made a comment saying that ontology is built too specifically will break the information system. We what we should do is distinguish between ontologies that are meant to help us design our software systems and ontologies meant to give purpose and meaning to what we do with those software systems. So we can have the ontology that says, how does it all map to how SysML v2 works? But then you can also have an ontology in the sense of meaning in the same ontology that says, how should system elements be interfaced with others so that if you know you have two system elements and you know they have an interface of a certain type, it can automatically generate that information based on the reusable pattern that they have identified. That's the purpose of it. That's the, the meaning part. Mm -hmm. What do we do with the stuff when we understand how it should be represented? We had a question in the room. Can you use the microphone? Okay. I raise this question as uh, you know, I totally understand uh, the point of having you know, just you know, every other case for every other uh, agency uh, and uh, them building their own ontologies, right? But as a community, we've all gathered together uh, and we don't us agree on one systems engineering ontology, right? Uh, I feel like we will still be based with an ad hoc approach uh, that is only tailored to specific use cases. Now that's where my motivation for that question came from. Um, you know, we can use any language that we want, descriptive logic or personal logic, whatever it is, but the underlying uh, uh, the underlying phenomena should be systems engineering, which some of it is sort of vague, but uh, we, we have this SE domain where we can all agree on certain elements of how they're related and what the concepts are. That's where the motivation is. Can I say something very quickly? Uh, agree with what Michael just said. You know, again, uh, sorry to go back to the past, but I don't know, 35 years ago when people were discussing ontologies, they were discussing ontologies for knowledge interchange. So reuse was the key word and not interoperability, right? But now when we look, 
fact that for decades, the re reuse of ontologies almost never happens or happens much, much uh, less than it should, it should be, right? And one of the reasons is exactly that. People, uh, it's premature optimization. People are really trying to craft an artifact, a logical specification to solve a very specific problem instead of focusing on capturing the real world semantics of the concepts at hand. Yeah, I actually, I have to respond to that. Um, so that's part of the, the, you know, trying to really capture the, the essential aspects of this conceptualization is actually really hard. Uh, I'll give you an example, metrology, right? Elisa mentioned metrology that Hans Peter and Roger Burkhardt are working on. I was also involved in the CCML 1.3.4 work on on the metrology library um, at jpl i've worked on a different approach using the vim which is vocabulary of international metrology from bureau the international de bois mesure in france and and i can see that there's effectively like different ways to actually think of even just the topic of quantities and units right i mean just two concepts like how hard could that be to get those abstractions right and it's actually very humbling to realize that it's really hard to figure out what's the right way to actually define an ontology of just these two things, quantities and units. And part of what's missing is, again, this driver about what's the purpose? What are we going to do with this particular ontology? And, and in a sense, it's, it's almost like a, there's very different purposes, like the question that somebody was asking about, like, oh, we had a project where somebody confused left, right, and right to left. Well, that's in a sense a problem about metrology, because if you don't know what a particular quantity means, like left of what, and what is that direction, you know, how do you define it? Well, that's one way to think about the problem purely from a metrological point of view. Another one might say, no, no, I just need to know, is this particular property a left to right, or is this like the kilogram or the price of the part, right? So I don't want to know too much about it. I just don't want to distinguish, you know, what the meaning of that particular information is. Very different perspectives, very different ways of thinking of metrology. And it's not clear to me exactly that we know how is the right way to build the ultimate abstraction of metrology that would serve now by some adaptation of specializations, those two different use cases, or perhaps even a third one. Um, so it's, I, on the other hand, like I'm going back to your question about, you know, we don't have like a good systems engineering vocabulary. Yeah, because we don't even know really how to come up with the right patterns to abstract systems engineering thinking. But what Steve you know, Jenkins was referring to about these patterns that we came up with back in MC, you know, 10 years ago or so, was basically, you know, you know, we old gizzards, right, trying to realize, yeah, maybe we should think differently about what, you know, requirement is and how it is specified. And, and, and unfortunately, there's a lot of um, baggage that we have with some different conceptualizations or even the concept of requirement that now creates some problems about, you know, are we going to be able to really abstract with the right way to think ontologically what, what requirement is? Uh, if you thought that quantities and units was simple, requirement is an even bigger mess because it's so informal in, in the way we've been, you know, talking about requirements in systems engineering. So sometimes I'm I'm somewhat like uh, um, less enthused about the ability for us to figure out, you know, are we going to clean up this mess, or are we going to be still, you know, our children and grandchildren <laughs> inheriting basically a, a big ontological, you know, soup of, of disconnected ways of thinking of systems engineering. You're you're nailing the problem. These and Kane, you said it too. These ontologies are designed for reuse, but nobody reuses them because they're either designed at an in 
uh, an inappropriate level of abstraction or they're not in the language someone prefers to use or they're not specific to a given domain or they use a term that's defined differently in a different domain. We are going to be here 60 years from now arguing these same points if we don't come together as an ontological community and decide what do we agree on to be the definition. And you nailed it. Systems engineering does not currently have a mathematical underpinning. As much as we like to talk about how great it is and how much money it saves everybody and how useful it is, there's no math underneath. It's just heuristics. It, the, the, there is math. No one's figured out exactly how to put it all into mathematical formulation. We've got ideas, but like we haven't proven it yet. So imagine you wanted recommendations for how we communicate, how we communally decide on how to fix this. The problem that we currently face is centralized authority in the top and mid-level ontologies. And this is not to dunk on any of the, the authorities not on NCOR or Kubrick or on the OMG or in COSI or anybody, but one centralized authority anywhere is not going to serve our purposes and we will continue to reuse these on or not reuse these ontologies. What we need is a group, OMG and COSI, AIAA, IEEE, everybody uh, from these variety of ontological ontology development communities being voting members and we produce what we think these ontology structures should be in OWL, in OML, and first order logic. And there may be more, more onto UML if we decide we want to add languages, but if we can represent the same concepts with the same relationships in the different languages, we will get past this barrier and we will at least decide on top level and mid-level ontologies that we can communally use and we won't have to keep making layers between them. No, OMG's already got a bunch of options. Well, so. it's not just that. I'm going to be quick. Um, I know. So the Commons Library is not a top-level or mid-level ontology. What we have are Lego bricks. And the whole idea is the people make abstractions at the top levels that screw you over when you're trying to reuse it for various purposes. And very few people understand the nuances. And you have to really understand those top level ontologies to know what it's going to do to your underlying system way downstream. And so we didn't go that route. We created a really, really basic library that has a few very common patterns in it that everybody needs. And ones that we've reused across multiple projects already and have vetted across multiple projects in entirely different domains. And because we could do that, and you can look, some of them are like have two classes in them. They're really, really tiny and they're designed to be building blocks that you could reuse. And on the pharma project, reusing the library we generated out of some financial work and out of some other projects, one in retail, one in manufacturing for OMG, it saved us over a year in development. Just saying, and and we don't have those top level commitments that would mess you up. And some people can layer that on top, but um, but we didn't go that route. And what I would ask is that maybe we look at the on um, the little ontologies we have so far and see if we can also add the OML versions. See if we can also add the first order versions. See if we can also add the onto UML versions to the same library so that everybody has those artifacts they can use with the same ontological commitments roughly um, for whatever purpose they need. I mean, that's what the library is about. It's not supposed to be only an OWL library. It's supposed to be a library that everybody can reuse no matter what practice they're in. So I would love to have that experiment with you and see if we can't make that useful for everybody in the room. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have to wrap it up there because we're now out of time, but I think that was a great way to uh, to wrap up that discussion.